Hello and welcome to episode 21 of the League and the General Just Covered podcast, where we talk to intermediaries, advisors and key people in our industry about their views and opinions on protection. My name's Wayne. And I'm Hazel. And today we're really lucky to be joined by Phil, who's the Director of Corporate Strategy at Reassured, who's going to really talk to us a little bit about his career and why protection's such a passion of his, but also a little bit about his own story um, and why protection's been so important. So welcome, Phil. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. And uh, so do you want to start us off then? Just tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into industry. Well, sure. Thank you. Um, Yeah, so I came straight out of school and was desperate for a career in financial services and insurance, probably like you guys. Um, No, the truth is there was an open day at Abbey Nationals, it was called then, um, near me, and they were recruiting entry-level staff. So I I joined at the bottom. I was a a grade B clerk. There wasn't a grade A. So Mm -hmm. right at the bottom, just doing some... uh, I mean, in those days, it was paper, sending letters to customers and things like that. So that was my entry into financial services. And then quite quickly, I transitioned onto the sales side and was doing remortgages for customers and those sorts of things. Became a kind of IFA, got my financial planning certificates and then moved business to business. So for the last 20 years, I've been firmly in the life insurance sector and I've held roles at insurers, insure techs, reinsurers. And and now I'm at uh, Reassured, which is the largest intermediary in the life insurance sector in the UK. Nice. Yeah, so you've, you've definitely done well since that since the days of the paper, <laughs> and it's funny, isn't it? Because as you said, nobody ever really means to come into financial services. I've That's an interesting yet. concept, isn't it? No, no, nobody yet. I'm sure there is somebody. Maybe you can get them on the podcast. Yeah. Without an appeal. Did you, Here did we you, go. Did you any, want to be? In any industry? listeners? If you'd planned that from school, <laughs> get in touch. <laughs> but it's a great industry to be in. I'm very glad I am in it and, and have remained in it. Mm-hmm. It's a uh, you know, it's it's we give ourselves a really hard time, I think, in, in life insurance and financial services as a whole. Um, but actually, you know, when you look at the the emphasis we place on the customer at all times and, you know, the, the rigor we place around, uh, you know, how we look after our customers and how we treat them, I think we're so much better than other industries. And the people that are in it are generally really nice people who care about the end result. So it's a great place to be, even if you didn't plan to be here in the first place. Yeah, I found it, well, we were talking just before we started rolling the camera about what we did previously and I did physio when I first left uh, school did it for a couple of years at uni and then went in as a trainee mortgage advisor I decided physio wasn't for me and so many people said to me that is completely different how on earth have you done that 180 but genuinely as a physio you're asking questions to find a solution and put a plan in place for somebody so actually the skill set and what I was doing was the exact same but I preferred the environment and financial mm. services compared to, to working in hospitals. So it actually was very, very similar skill set about that care, customer first and, and really focusing that person in front of you. I was told years and years ago that everything sales when you boil it down, because I suppose mm. if you're a physio, you're selling the solution to your patient, aren't you? That mm. These are things you need to do in order to make yourself better. And then you go into mortgages and you're selling the, the mm. advice that you're giving them on their mortgage. And, you know, basically you're selling yourself at all times or you're selling a product to selling a solution so if you think of it that way everything's the same yeah that is true <laughs> that is true it's people and relationships as well isn't it exactly Building that yeah and what's i'm intrigued what's kept you in the industry then obviously for 20 years since you came into b2b what's yeah. kept you here uh, a lack of transferable skills <laughs> <laughs> I, I think um th- th- and joking aside you get to a point don't you in an industry where you've built up such a you know thankfully a reputation and a, and a network of contacts that transfer in actually a different industry would be difficult and as i say when i've when i've moved roles in the past and reflected on it i've wanted to stay in the industry i really like it i think you know we do a good job for 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 the customer it's an important product you know it's not the most glamorous or exciting and you know i've not been to a dinner party yet where someone's asked me to tell them more about life insurance (laughs) um but it's it's a really good industry to be in and, and it's one that I'm proud to represent. So, so yeah, I've just, uh, I've always enjoyed being part of it. And definitely fast paced as well, isn't it? It's always something new going on, isn't it? Always something new going on, but backed by kind of decades or sometimes centuries of, of um, experience and research and, and knowledge. So it's got that nice balance of, yeah, you've got some institutions that have been around for forever and a day and some of the most well-known brands like Legal and General, you know, in, in the whole of the country. Um, but yeah, always with new products and a focus on change. So it's great. Yeah. And uh, you, sorry, Wayne. <laughs> well, you started as an IFA. You said that's yeah. something that you you went to have national and decided to progress as an IFA. It's quite maybe unusual for then an IFA to be so passionate about protection and then actually end up focusing in and and that being the route that they took. So, what was the decision uh, around that? That's a really good question. I think if I'm 
honest, the landscape was changing quite a lot. So, so I became an IFA mainly because it was, it was a requirement for selling endowments, which at the time were, were, were really um, dominant in the mortgage sector. So as a mortgage broker, they wanted me to train as a financial advisor so I could advise on endowments. And almost as soon as I became authorised, funnily enough, as a legal and general tied agent, um, the endowment scandal hit the hit the press, and and effectively the product the product stopped being sold. So mm-hmm. so I never really put that FPC mm-hmm. certificate into into effect. So I think because the market was so turbulent, and I was you know looking around for for where the next stage of my career went, and business to business was just a yeah. happy coincidence rather than a strategic plan. Yeah. Absolutely. I think it's really good being business to business. So if you've had that experience Definitely. in the space of an advisor and, and kind of done that that role as well. Yeah, even though it's more than 20 years ago mm-hmm. that I was doing that job, I can still put myself in that position. And I think that, that gives you an authenticity when you're talking to people who are still at that cold face. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. And when you're an advisor, obviously you're dealing with customers and you're talking about, and protection was part of it. I know there yeah. was the endowment element, which yeah. was a form of protection in a way, but how did you sort of... Um, articulate the importance of that? How did you, so were there, were there certain things that you did at that time? Did Was there training you went through that enabled loads, you to do loads that? Loads of training. The training back then, it was in an interesting transition period. I mean, I like calling it the turn of the century because it makes you sound like you're on the Antiques Roadshow, doesn't it? But it was, <laughs> it was the turn of the last century. So, so um, we were transitioning, I think, as an industry from quite an old fashioned sales approach of, um, uh, door-to-door selling you know you'd go to sit in the customer's home to do the recommendation with them and the life insurance aspect of that was the, the training that I went through was was quite brutal they were still talking about um, disturbing the need which obviously the regulator in, in more recent years has said you know is is a, is a practice that that, that that should be outlawed and thankfully has been but in those days that was absolutely the, absolutely the norm that you disturbed the customer so that they wanted to buy the product so it was very much you know, challenging them. If I was sitting here and you were a, a couple, I'd be saying, well, what would you do if Wayne, you know, died tomorrow? How would you pay the bills? And it was, you know, making you go, oh, oh what would I do? You know, and, and then I, you know, I could I could tell you the, the life insurance that would protect against that need. So that was how I was originally trained back in the day. Um, I never really put that into practice, um, not because I was some sort of visionary in my early 20s and, and knew that the regulation was going to impose that, but, but actually just because I was ever very comfortable doing that and I was a little bit more of a cheerful kind of, you know, upbeat personality and it, it, it never really gelled in me to suddenly turn into the, you know, the Grim Reaper in someone's lounge. So so it was much more um, the way the protection's sold nowadays, which is um, telling stories giving examples of, you know, scenarios where, you know, things have gone wrong for people and the, the fact they have these safety nets in place and what these products can do and having that kind of open conversation with a, with a family typically to, to kind of talk to them about, well, what are your plans? You know, it's brilliant you're getting this mortgage. It's great that we're getting into this new property. You know, what happens if, you mm. know, can we do something about that and just being a little bit more consultative, I suppose. Mm. Yeah. And that's really important being consultative, isn't it? Well, obviously when you, you're talking to customers and building that relationship with them, um, and in a previous episode before, we've talked about caring for customers, you yeah. know, immersing yourself in their world, all that type of thing. When you're mentioning stories like you were there, early in your career, where were you taking those stories from? Was it colleagues? Was it family members? Where was that coming from? No, I think, I think the really difficult thing um, for, for most people when they start out is because you're young, you don't have a lot of experience yourself. So, I mean, I luckily, you know, never experienced any significant loss, certainly never experienced any ill health myself or anything like that. So I didn't have any personal stories to tell. So you rely on the insurers really to give you those case studies. And I think even even back then and, and more so now, insurers are great at giving you those case studies that, that say, here's a here's a real life example of someone that's used this product. And then you can put yourself in those in those people's shoes. I think it's, if I was an advisor now, I think it'd be much better because you can be so much more empathetic. I mean, I didn't have kids. Like I said, I had very little life experience. So you're kind of trying to tell someone that's twice your age and twice your experience what they should be doing. And and, and it's a fine line between uh, whether they find that believable or not really, isn't it, in a young upstart mm-hmm. that's sat in their front room or, or, or over the phone to them. Um, but yeah, case studies is absolutely, I, I think it was always stories rather than statistics that, that, that get people to buy protection. Mm-hmm. Yeah, important stuff, isn't it? I think we had one of the previous episodes as well where we talked about the importance of doing that and telling stories. And being patient in the way you tell them, I think, yeah, and, and articulating the, the key elements of them that, that relate to the, to the customer that's in front of you, because everyone's different, as we know. Yeah. They? So you know, it's not going to be a one one size fits no, all. It's, it's trying to find out what's motivating that customer ultimately, isn't it? I mean, a lot of people used to say they found it difficult selling to selling protection to single people mm-hmm. because it's so much easier. You know, as a parent myself, obviously, 
now if you if you ask me what would happen you know if if you, know, if you couldn't look after mm -hmm. your family that's a much more emotive it's a really kind of just easy trigger for people isn't it whereas for single people that's a kind of harder picture to paint but as a single person myself i found that quite easy because mm -hmm. if people said to me oh it'll be fine i'll just go back and live with mum and dad i'd say do you want to do that no god no i can wait to get out of home oh great okay well there's protection we can put in place that means if you even if you did get ill for a bit you wouldn't have to mm -hmm. should we look at that oh yeah good yeah or even do your mum and dad want you to do that? You know, is this you know is this an open offer, or is your is your room being redecorated and turned into an office right now? You know, so just just prodding a little bit of those kind of um, objections and, and overcoming them. Uh, I bet let's get a few people thinking. Oh yeah, actually they have just been going to B and Q quite a lot recently. <laughs> yeah. Dad has been buying some gym equipment, yeah. Yeah. overhead protector. Um, yeah, I think if you challenge, it, and it's the same with any objection, you know, you have to just politely challenge them and just say, have you really thought this through? I'd rely on my savings. Oh, perfect. How much savings have you got? You know, you're just buying this new house. What's left in the kitty? Mm. Not a lot. Ah, okay. Yeah. Right, let's let's think of something else. And quite often they, they have those as solutions just because they've never been asked to think of any yeah. alternative. So they've put those ideas or solutions in a subconsciously in place because they don't know there's something else out there. Yeah. Isn't it? And we all want a plan B of some sort. Um, if we don't know that the plan B could be a lump sum of money, yeah. then I guess you do think, oh, I'll move in this parents or I'll, I'll have to rinse my savings, if any. And yeah, it's, it's, I think people think that when the answer is actually a really sensible answer because they've, they've not ever thought of an alternative. Yeah, yeah, they think they think they're giving mm -hmm. you the, the good answer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it, and and it might well be, you know, maybe using your savings or moving back in with mum and dad is the right solution. But you know, mm -hmm. it's it's important to know that there's other options exactly. out there. And people, again, this hasn't changed. I think in the in the decades I've been in the industry, people really overestimate how much protection costs. If you if you if you just ask friends, family, you know, how much they think it costs, they they they'll always overestimate it by you know two or mm -hmm. three times what the actual premium is for for this stuff. And you know people are mistrustful of insurance that that hasn't particularly changed i think we do a really good job of trying to change that by publishing our claim statistics and mm -hmm. you know using those case studies as often as we can to show that the products do what they're intended to do but you're never going to overcome a sort of healthy skepticism that the british public have around large institutions of any sort whether that's the bbc or legal in general so you, you just need to you know draw those objections out and then and then try and politely overcome them as, mm -hmm. as as patiently as you can as you said Wayne you know without just ramming statistics down people's throats you know try and build that rapport understand what the triggers are and then and then see if we can overcome them but but ultimately once you show somebody that the solutions are there and that they're really cost effective and you know the, the, the statistics that back them up do support everything that you're saying you know, most people take the sensible option yeah absolutely so you're saying um you mentioned as well that that conversation evolves so you've got like your young kind of single cohort of, of customers mm. maybe you deal with them one way but you said even personally yourself now that you've got children that has changed slightly how you now view uh, protection and things how how has that um, impacted your life choices and things that, that you've done um I, I think in terms of impacting the way i see the the market mm. I think you move from, well, I'll speak personally. I, mm. Personally, I moved from it being a sales job where I was, you know, selling life insurance. I wanted to do a good job. I wanted to, you know, make sure customers had the right thing. But how I measured my success was whether I'd sold enough policies that month. And 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 now it's much more around um, have I done a good job for the customer first and then it's mm. have i you know hit the other metrics i think would be the way i'd look at it um mm. as a more mature person again it's much more that that empathy you have for the consumer for, for me evolved as i became more mature it's so difficult to do that i think you know as a 21 year old coming into the industry or whatever to put yourself in the shoes of a 46 year old you know you just you couldn't do it effectively it wouldn't be authentic yeah, no, of course. And then you've obviously had quite a year yourself personally. So yeah. if we, if we look at that. Do you want to share a little bit with our listeners about what your year's been like and, and a bit of your own story? Yeah, so I, I suppose somewhat ironically for somebody that's been, you know, pushing, um, promoting the life insurance and critical illness market for most of their career, um, I ended up being diagnosed with cancer in February. Mm -hmm. So I was suddenly kind of poacher turned gamekeeper and uh, and staring down the barrel of being a, a customer of our product as opposed to a promoter of it. So um, uh, yeah, that that uh, has been a, an interesting experience to, to, to go through over the last, yeah, as you say, it's coming up for 12 months from when I first sort of started noticing some problems to yeah, uh, that would have been December last year when I when I first mm -hmm. got in touch with the doctor. 
Yeah, well, sorry to hear that. And obviously, it's been, a, I'm sure, a, a roller coaster a year with everything yeah. going on. What was that? I'm curious to know because I think the thing we talk about a lot is after the payout, what people do and, and actually how they utilize the, the funds. But what was the journey to diagnosis like? So I'll tell you the, the I'll tell you the whole story in, in boring detail. Um, <laughs> so so I I started noticing some some stomach issues in in as I say December last year, and you know indigestion y type stuff. Mm -hmm. So you know put it down to fairly normal. Okay, let's just see if this sorts itself out. But it didn't go away for a week or two, and then I started noticing some blood in my stools, and that's mm -hmm. that's not you know that's never happened and that's not normal. It's really funny as somebody that again has been talking about the need for critical illness cover and you know looking after yourself and all these types of things for so long. And then, and then to be on the receiving end of seeing, you know, looking into the toilet bowl without getting too graphic with you and seeing blood and your brain tries to make sense of it. And you start thinking, have I eaten a lot of beetroot recently? Mm. I don't like beetroot. I, I've never eaten it. So there's no way. So you start thinking about, well, could it be? What was in that sandwich I ate yesterday? You know, rationally, you know, this is not a good thing. and I need to go and get it checked out. But your brain tries to kind of help you and say, no, no, no. You're trying to normalize it. Normalize your first it. reaction appears that way. Yeah. E even as like an intelligent person that's in an industry that educates this sort of thing. So so ha having seen that, um, I made the decision I needed to, to go and see a doctor. Um, as it turns out, and this is, I think, where, where the relevance ties back into the, to the industry. Um, it was actually through my private medical cover through, through Bupa. Um, I had a, a virtual GP access, but obviously loads of life insurers have that option on their policies as well. Um, so, so actually, I was, at a, I was at a conference and I made an appointment on the Bupa app to, to speak to a virtual GP that day. So I was checking in at my salubrious travel lodge, um, talking to this, to this doctor, described my symptoms. They referred me to, to a consultant. So I saw a consultant in the December um, he referred me, he said, it's probably nothing to worry about. You know, you're in great, great shape. His words, not mine. Uh, you, you're young. His words, not mine. You're um, fitting them in though. You're making absolutely. sure they're on, I, on I, tape. I wrote them all down. <laughs> um, and, uh, and no family history of anything, you know, particularly unpleasant like that. So he said, it's probably nothing to worry about. Let's get it checked out. You know, let's put cameras in both ends and, you know, have a, have a look round. So that was, that was scheduled in for the January. And, uh, and yeah, so one Saturday in, in, in fact, it was early February, um, I had that endoscopy and colonoscopy. Uh, the colonoscopy is funny, funny, not ha-ha, interesting, mm -hmm. weird, mm -hmm. in that uh, they, they, they give you a kind of sedative. So you're a bit in and out. You're not, you're not completely unconscious, but you're not really with it. And so I remember bits of it and not other bits, but I distinctly remember seeing the screen uh, and the camera, you know, mm -hmm inside me and 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 him taking a, uh, a biopsy of, of obviously what looked like mm -hmm. a tumor so I, i've got that that image in my mind and and i said to him that's not supposed to be there is it and of course he didn't answer you're not going to strike up a conversation with someone that's sedated and he's you know doing a colonoscopy on um but yeah and and so straight after that so so i knew straight away okay there's something in there um and and so when they come in and say, oh, is, is your is your wife picking you up? You know, is someone picking you up? Like, yeah, yeah, she'll be here in a minute. OK. And then we'll, what we'll do is we'll just put you into this room and the doctor will just have a little chat with you. Mm -hmm. like, OK. Yeah. So, again, it's all these things I've heard about through countless case studies from from legal and general and loads of other insurers mm -hmm. over the years of this is what a di cancer diagnosis looks and feels like. I'm like, oh, this is weird. This is me now. No, I'm being put in that little room. Also, you know, quite surreal. Totally I surreal. I was an out of, out of body experience because, it, yeah, I am that person that I've read about now, and it's absolutely me. So I knew exactly what was going to happen. I knew he was going to not going to say it was cancer because he didn't know at that point, but that he suspected it was. Um, I knew there was going to be a, a nurse sat in the corner as kind of a chaperone with a box of tissues, um, and I knew what the next step was. They'd send it away, see what it was, and then decide on the treatment. So mm -hmm. just totally bizarre. So at, at that point my mind switched straight into worrying about I wasn't worried about myself at that point at all that's not because I'm some sort of selfless hero mm -hmm. at all it's just that I knew all this already I was quite mm -hmm. comfortable in that scenario right fine and we'll see what it is and then we'll deal with it but your wife your children your parents your friends your colleagues who aren't in life insurance mm -hmm. don't know any of that this is all totally new for all of those people. how do you feel there because if you're either that type of person or you're in the industry and you know what's going to happen mm -hmm. and you're thinking right I'll deal with it whatever happens at that yeah. time. How do you deal with it, the fact that your family aren't like that? They might not be as 
able at that point in time to deal with what's happening? How, how do you feel? What, that, what are you doing at that time? That's the hardest bit. By by a mile, the hardest mm. bit was 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 managing or trying to manage those other people's feelings at, at that point. Um, my instinct was. My instinct, if I'm honest, was I'd rather nobody else knew about it and I just crack on. Mm. I mean, A, that's not practical, and B, that's not fair on other people because you know, you need, you know, they 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 need your support and they need other support as well. But my instinct was I'd be much happier if I was just told, right, this this is what's gonna happen and I just get on with it. Um, but actually I I did the opposite and I, I you know, I, I told everybody this is what this is what's happening and this is what the next steps are, and just tried to make people as comfortable as possible that, you know, it's not great news, but equally, you know. It's all, it's all, it's all something we can deal with. It's all something that, that we can cope with, and you know, not to worry too much. So, but that's by far the hardest bit. Yeah. And that was like a roughly kind of an eight nine week turnaround then for you, was it? Yeah. From, so December from, to February. She, yeah, it felt it felt really quick. Yeah. And and then and then I have to say, so that was the kind of the booper experience, um, the private healthcare experience, at, at, at the point where the biopsy comes back, which was only, I don't know. A few days later, it's really quick. The biopsy comes back and confirms it's cancer, um, which again, mentally, I'd already, I was already there, so that was that wasn't a particular surprise. Um, at that point, the NHS kick in, and and they just they flip you to the NHS, and you know they have this turnaround. I think it's a two week turnaround between diagnosis and and, and treatment for that. So it, it's an unbelievable machine. So for the next week after that, it was just, you know, a battery of tests, you know, CT scans, MRI, blood tests, you know, I felt like I had needles in me, you know, pretty, pretty daily for, for a week. And then they, so and that enables them to put together a, a proper plan of treatment. I was incredibly lucky in that um, because I uh, realized it early, we di- diagnosed it early that my treatment plan was an operation and um, he was fairly confident from the scans that the, the doctor was fairly confident from the scans that it hadn't spread. It was going to be a, an operation to remove it and then that would be it and there shouldn't be any further treatment and, that, and that's how it panned out. So it was just a case of, right, when can we book you in for this operation? Yeah. And bearing in mind, no family history, as you said before, mm. can they give a, a rationale as to why or it's just, just no, like, that's and, it? No, and I've, I've subsequently, in, in fact, in the last few weeks had the... Um, the report back from the uh, NHS genetics folk who who look at the tumour and they look at your family history. And so at that point, I'd filled in a form that had my full family history going back to you know grandparents and everything um, to, to see. I mean, what they're trying to establish there is should my my sons be put on a screening process, my brother, those, those types of things. So, so I've seen the output from that and it's no, absolutely just one of those things. It's I'm at no greater risk of uh, of cancer now than I was before. It's one of those just odd anomalies. Mm. So I guess we'll never know why 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 it happened. And it goes back to some of what we talked about in the last episode: is that there's um, nobody uh, nobody could ever say that they're completely immune to something like this mm. happening because it, it's you know, cancer won't pick and chew. It literally could be anyone, isn't I, it? I, I am the cliche. I am yeah. the absolute cliche. I've really never had a sick day. You know, that, not really, really lucky absolutely blessed life you know never had a significant problem you know i'd had a couple of operations which were you know like a, a shoulder surgery and a wrist wrist surgery and stuff like that but never had an illness mm-hmm. rarely got ill um yeah as i say i gym goer keen runner never overweight you know mm-hmm. just the typical person that you'd say oh well you know i won't get that because you know i'm not that sort of person but mm-hmm doesn't pick and choose. Well, no. as we said before, illness isn't discriminatory, is it? No. It, it, it just isn't. No. It just yeah. it so apply to anyone. To- totally came out of the blue and, and thankfully was uh, fairly short in terms of treatment. Yeah. And I guess like when we went back to that, that diagnosis part, you, you were fortunate. The private health care really, really quick. I mean, it's scary to think how long that could have taken. If, I mean, you said the NHS were fantastic when you, you know, once you'd found out what it was and get yeah. back into that route. But I guess the trickiness is, is, is how many people are waiting to get onto that route, isn't it? And, that's and again, the back part. to Wayne's point about your, your brain mm-hmm. trying to help you out of the situation. Your brain says, yeah, it's December. Let's leave it till after Christmas, Phil. You know, let's see what happens. Mm-hmm. You know, it will probably have settled down over Christmas. Um, oh, it's, it's in the news all the time that GPs are hard to go and see. I bet that'll be a nightmare. Again, let's see if it dies down. It, when you entered the travel lodge, you were on the phone. Was that happening in December then? Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, you know, mid-December. Um, yeah. So so all of that, 
you know, procrastination in my brain was still going on in the background. Um, I do wonder because, you know, the type of cancer I had, catching it early is the key. You know, if it spreads, the type that type of cancer becomes inoperable. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not untreatable. They can, you know, give you, but it, it'll be the thing that kills you, mm-hmm. and and so time is absolutely the essence. And you know, the consultant that I had said it's like having a ticking time bomb inside you. You know, you don't know it's there, and at some point it's going to go off. What a way so, to describe it is that I was going to be shivers thinking he, of that. He, he did not have a brilliant bedside manner. I mean, he's a great mm. consultant, good at his job, mm. but yeah, he was pretty brutal in the way he described things. Um, yeah, and he kept going, oh, he's looking at the scan, oh, oh, and you think, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking inside me. Yeah. You're thinking, what's he going to tell me next? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> kind, of, kind of alarming guy, but um, but he left you no doubt that the seriousness of your situation and, and, the, and the, the luck of catching it you know, soon enough that it, that it hadn't spread and it was a relatively simple operation. Uh, you know, for, for a skilled doctor to carry out. Um, but yeah, the, the advantage, of, yeah, the, the, my worry, I suppose, in, this, in terms of the state of the NHS is I don't know if I'd gone to see an NHS doctor, A, how quickly I could have got in to see them, and B, whether, because as I say, the Bupa consultant was very relaxed given my, you know, health generally and my, and my family history. It was very relaxed that it wouldn't be anything serious. And I wonder if an NHS doctor would have been similarly relaxed and therefore you know tests and, and everything might might have been delayed and that could have been a big difference maker yeah. so yeah it does make you think definitely and and what about your recovery then so you've mentioned that you were very fit healthy enjoyed was it gym you know went to gym and things what, yeah what's that been like trying to get back now to where you were previously or and in, in the kind of maybe frustrations or challenges you've yeah had very frustrating so i think the 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 worst part about my treatment, because again, I'm super lucky. I had no chemo or anything like that. So really, really um, thankful. Um, but I had to have a, a stoma, so a colostomy mm-hmm. bag um, after the operation, um, which obviously is a massive lifestyle change. And there are loads of people who have stomas for the whole of their life mm-hmm. and it you know, saves their lives and they live with it and you'd never know. And you know, it's just one of those things. Um, but it is a you know an adaptation and it was a, a massive change and psychologically it's hard to deal with and mm. you know it, it, you have a few dark moments you know with things like that um and yeah in terms of exercise it, it makes it difficult you know because suddenly you're adapting to a new part of your body basically and yeah it was it was tricky i was also i didn't adapt well phys- physically to the stoma i was dehydrating a lot i wasn't able to keep fluids in very well so i looked awful you know i was slim anyway and then you drain yourself of moisture you just look a little bit you know deathly you have to sort of train yourself to eat again as well i know the reason i know because i've got a close family member right. that's had one for 10 years yeah i've um, been reversed now but he, and even with that you have to just retrain yourself know what you can eat what you can drink when you can do it how often you can do it it, it just consumes yeah. your thought yeah really um you're constantly thinking what am i going to eat next how's it performing what have i got where have i got to be where's the nearest facility where i can yeah. empty it you know all those things that you've just never thought about before you just take them for granted mm-hmm. so really difficult and when you layer on yeah wanting to get back in the gym and build your strength back up you know it's just another barrier um since the stoma was reversed in july i feel like i'm kind of touch wood back to something like normal you know there's a few as, as you say wayne you know the bowel needs to get back into its you know normal habits which isn't mm. overnight uh mm. so so that's still a little bit of an ongoing process of course but um but the stoma being reversed feels like a, a big step in that process the, the biggest thing with going back to the gym was um i mean anybody anybody over 30 certainly over 40 and i'm sure as you get older you know Two weeks out of the gym feels like you're starting from scratch. <laughs> you know, you go on holiday and come back and you're like, right, I'm starting from scratch again. That's how it feels. I mean, you can imagine what it feels like when you've had an operation and and then had a stoma fitted and then all these different things. And it, so it was it was really months out of the gym properly. So it does feel like I'm back to square one on a lot of stuff, which is psychologically quite difficult. But I'm a big believer in exercise being really, really good for your mental health. And so psychologically, not setting myself any targets for running 5Ks or anything daft, but just being able to get back in there on a regular basis and and feel like I'm doing something healthy has been a huge step forward psychologically. Absolutely, because that's a lot for your mind to go through in, in such a short space of time. Really. Yeah. And, and as you said, you're then taking a psychological burden I mean, not a burden, but of your family, friends. It is a burden, and, yeah, yeah. And yeah. your own you know your own psychological thoughts of, of kind of your, your body how it's changing yeah and then you can't do the one thing that keeps you kind of motivated and healthy and i'm just thinking from a 
customer point of view, imagine then having financial worry and that lack of, of that. lack of security you know, that, on top that, of that, it. That's the thing for me, I think in terms of making these case studies come to life, I mean, I've obviously now got an easy one. If I, if I was selling life insurance direct to a customer now, I, I, you know, I'd be you know, finding it very easy. You're but, a walking answer. Yeah, absolutely. Really but in terms of any um, agent or advisor that's, that's offering life insurance, and when, and when I talk to, to my colleagues at Reassured who are on the phones doing that job, it is painting that picture of... Um, this is just one thing you shouldn't have to be worrying about. There's enough. There's enough. I wasn't worried about the physical side of treatment. Again, I knew what, what to expect. I knew there was going to be an operation. I knew there might be chemotherapy. I knew there might be drugs. And, you know, I might be finding it difficult. I might lose my hair. Uh, that was a joke, <laughs> by the way. Um, I knew all of that. And I was braced and prepared. And I thought, I can cope with all of that. I'm fit. Um, healthy. I've got my friends and my family all around me. I'm really, really in the right position to deal with that. So I prepared for that. I wasn't prepared for um, the emotional side of it at all. At all. That's the bit that uh, that I really struggled with, you know, how my kids are feeling. I mean, they're adults, right? These are, you know, so I can have proper conversations, but um, how they were feeling, my wife, my parents, you know, you know, seeing their son be, you know, going through this and worrying about it. Burden's the word you use. And I think that's right. And it's not, you know, um, it's not easy at all. And and then, you know, the after effects of things like a stoma, yeah, like the psychological impact that has. Again, fine, you're going to have to have a stoma. Yep, yeah, bring it on. Fine, if that's what's necessary. No problem at all. I can deal with that. Um, but the emotional side of that and having to just think about how you adapt your lifestyle around those sorts of things is draining. And now kind of where I feel like I'm coming out at the end of the whole saga, like I say, not quite there yet, but I feel like I'm kind of at the end of the process looking back on it. I don't think I gave myself enough credit during the during that process. Looking back, I think you used the you know the, the cliche of the roller coaster. Mm. I don't think at the time I realised how much of a how much of a stress it was putting on me. And you look at it now and think, wow, yeah, that was. Was that fight or flight mode, isn't it? Like I'm just going to get through this. Just going to get through it to get my head down and plow on. Yeah. But just- I also the, the other funny thing was. Um, the emotion of people being nice to you. <laughs> so this is not that people are normally horrible to me, um, but, you know, we, we we have a culture and I've always been in sales environments and those, you know, sporting environments. And it's it's kind of, um, you know, the way you show affection to one another is kind of just teasing and mickey taking and name calling and all those sorts of things. And, you know, so I'm really used to all of that. Um, suddenly for people to be very, frank and open and caring with you and you can see the you know the genuine you know worry and care and love that they're showing you that's so hard to deal with I found myself really tearful at times I'm like why is this happening and I think it's just because that's never been something you've had to confront really or 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 deal with so yeah that was a really weird one for me that yeah the nicer people were to me the you know the more emotional I got about it it was almost like yeah, again, it, it just made it feel more real, I suppose. Did you prefer if they just gave you the band to every day? No, I really, <laughs> I did really appreciate it. And there were, yeah, like I say, I'm not trying to um, overstate my um, my situation. I was really lucky. I wasn't in hospital for long mm. at all. Mm. I, you know, I didn't have a difficult treatment process or anything. You keep saying, though, for really lucky, but I guess, which is, it's so humble and, and lovely to hear. But then I guess it's, you've, it's such a magnitude. What you've been through is such a, it's huge, isn't yeah, it? And, and yeah. actually for... For when we look at like sounds like awful like statistics and how rare it would have been for you to get it, it's it's unlucky. You know, you've got unlucky, but then I, really lucky to have found it. Yeah, it's like I, I, I definitely a, feel more lucky than yeah. unlucky. As I say, yeah. in my life prior to this experience, I'd had no you know, no bumps yeah. in the road, so you can't help but feel like well, I was due something, and and, it, and if it's going to be something, then I, you know something yeah. that's you know a six month experience is better than something that kills you mm. or whatever. So I do feel like I'm on the luckier side of the spectrum, definitely. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. There, there were some pretty miserable moments and, and having those really nice messages and gifts and, uh, you know, WhatsApps and LinkedIn messages and all these different things from people made a huge difference. You can't overstate that. And I would, prior to this, I'd have said, no, nah, that wouldn't make any difference to me. Right. I would have mm-hmm. absolutely said, no, couldn't, you know, I just, yeah, I just, I just deal with it. It absolutely helped. So isn't it, it's interesting that I'm thinking from like a, I can customer psyche point of view mm. when when you're sat making a decision on will I take this policy won't I or an advisor is you know talking to a client will they won't they you're basing it on your 
your mental state and how you think you deal with things now. Yes. So you're making a decision based on where you are right now rather than actually, as you said, you've now learned about yourself that mm. it was a completely different situation when you were actually in it. Um, never never had to confront it before. Mm. Um, yeah. Uh, was constantly surprised by the way I was reacting to things. Constantly. Mm. Yeah. So you learn a lot more about yourself. Which again, I, I feel really privileged to to have had that opportunity. I'd rather have you know, had it a different way, maybe. I could have run a marathon or something, couldn't I? But um, but pri- privileged to to have gone through that and be able to share it with people. Um, yeah, put, putting myself in the in the customer position or or in the position of yeah, someone that's that's selling life insurance, offering protection, critical illness cover to people. I think just pausing to to move it beyond that. Yeah, one in two people in their lifetime will get cancer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of yeah. I think most people now are aware that cancer is prevalent. They kind of know the stats. They, they know that, you know, they're either going to be lucky or unlucky and they'll, they'll, mm. they'll, they'll either be treatable or not. Um, they understand chemotherapy and all these other terms and processes. So they kind of mentally have, have put themselves in that position at some point to sort of say, well, how would I deal with it? So I think it's just pausing on those moments to say, yeah, you know, when I went through it, what I wasn't prepared for was the emotional side of things and, you know, the mm. impact it had on those around me and how I had to think about that kind of thing. And, you know, a case studies are a great way of doing it. Personal experience is obviously really powerful, but case studies can do that just as well. Mm. Just sharing that with and letting a customer just sit in that for a moment rather than just brushing it off as a kind of cold medical conversation or statistical conversation to, to really think about, you know, what would you do in that situation? How would you... How would you feel? How would your friends and family feel? And you know, can we take away at least one part of that burden, which is the financial side of it? Yeah, yeah I mean, I went through the same, very similar timing to um, Kate Middleton. Oh, yeah. uh, I'm not, I'm not, you know, particularly, uh, you know, um, invested in the royal family. I'm kind of ambivalent towards the whole thing, but you know, that was in the press at all the same time, and it was a similar kind of condition, and it, set, it looks like a similar sort of treatment and recovery process, and. Um, you know, she seems to have faced into it stoically and um, and and bravely, and and is and is back, you know, performing her duties as quickly as she could, and all those sorts of things, which is fantastic and and, and good to see her looking well. One thing she would definitely not have to worry about was the finances, mm-hmm. and that must have been, a, a, you know, she, it wouldn't have even crossed her mind, would it? Whereas for the vast majority of, of us, I think that would have been one of the first things you'd think of, wouldn't it? After what's the treatment, what's the process? It would be, uh oh, how long am I going to be off work? How am I going to pay these bills? Mm. So just to have that that one headache out of the way is 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 massive. It's the impact, isn't it? Like you said, you had all these. Was it for two a two week period? You had you know, um, injections, yeah, yeah. Or tests, whatever. So you're having to travel for those. Yeah. So then the cost adds up. So you I mean, the immediately parking. you think, yeah, parking. <laughs> it's crazy. People Park, say about that. Don't parking they? hospital is 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 crazy. It's a huge amount of money. So, you know, I'm super lucky. You know, I've had a successful career. So both my kids are adults now. We've got other incomes in the household. If I needed to rely on it, I could have done. Um, I've got a very supportive employer and reassured who, you know, I didn't have to worry about them. And, you know, they were incredibly helpful and supportive. Just, you know, do whatever you need to do and we'll support whatever you need. Um, not everyone's in that position at all. And it, and it starts from day one. It starts from diagnosis. Absolutely starts from diagnosis. And, and, and at that point, you don't know how long that process is going to be. You know, for, for me, it was weeks before I get back, back to work and then months before you're back to something like normal and it'll be a few more months before I'm hopefully back completely to normal. For some people, that never happens. This is an ongoing thing. Um, or it could be months off work and, you know. The stoma was the other interesting thing because the stoma has nothing to do with critical illness. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just a, a byproduct of the treatment. And at that point, the NHS are kind of, We've cured you, mate. You've got not got cancer anymore. Congrats. Um, you know, we'll book you in for the stoma reversal when we've got time. Um, again, I, I got it reversed because I've got private care. I'd still be on the waiting list with the mm. NHS. I'd still have the stoma. If I was coping in the same way with the stoma as I was at the start, where I was constantly dehydrated and feeling faint when I stood up, and I was a scaffolder, I'm not working. Mm. You know, I could go back to my job with a stoma, and frankly, no one would have known the difference. Um, but if you had a manual job, and and it, and it wasn't working, you know, well for you. You'd be off work still. And I think it's the it's that um, it's a, it's that interesting bittersweet moment, isn't it? Of we've cured you, mm. you you've not got cancer, and um, we've managed to remove it. Because I remember 
well, one of my family members um, said that that was actually, getting told that they didn't have cancer was actually one of the most stressful parts of the journey because all of a sudden they now had to come into reality wow. of what their new body was like. They hadn't had critical illness cover. So they now all of a sudden had all of the bills to worry about because nobody chases you when you've got cancer. Yeah. The minute you now don't have that, it's like actually re- the reality hits of your new normal. Yes. And it's what's well, not normal. It's, it's definitely not what you picked for your life, isn't it? So it's, it's a really... Um, jarring moment that definitely and again that's where I, I keep using the word lucky but that's where i felt incredibly lucky again that yeah i knew i could get the stoma reverse more quickly because i had the private care um i yeah i, I knew there was no treatment required you know um following on from that so it did feel when when i got the phone call to say yeah it's definitely not spread and you haven't got it and no further treatment as much as i was expecting it so it wasn't you know i wasn't kind of on the edge of my seat yeah, that definitely felt like a landmark. But yeah, I could totally imagine if 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 I didn't have that 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 comfort, um, that it would have felt like, oh, okay, great. Well, who's looking after me now? Because the NHS are amazing, but they're limited, hugely limited. And, um, and yeah, and it was very much, yeah, you're done with us now. Yeah, we're moving on quite rightly to the next person that really needs us. Yes. But you're you're basically on your own. And again, so linking that back to the industry and the products that we offer, whether that's private medical or, or protection. Um, those ancillary benefits like the mental health support, like the nurse supports, you know, I've been offered that type of thing through the NHS, through Bupa and through my critical illness policy. They've all offered me ongoing support from, you know, um, uh, cancer specialists for whatever I needed. I haven't felt I needed to take advantage of them, but they've been offered to me multiple times. It's fantastic that they have, though, isn't it? That's great. Particularly in the the post-consumer duty world, you know, you're vulnerable in that scenario, aren't you? And they're, they're signposting... And, and 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 letting you know that it's all out there for you to use, and it's still and there to do it, you know, uh, in perpetuity if I want to use it, yep. which is, which is great. So, yeah, I have thought about actually um, some some of the mental health stuff. I guess it's, it's tricky, isn't it? I, I, I you know, um, like I say, going back to my training in financial services and sales, where it was quite a brutal, you know, sell 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 culture that, that I was coming into, um, and. You certainly, the environment I grew up in, you you didn't, you know, it's, it's the old fashioned men's thing of you don't show, you don't show weakness, you don't, you know, you get on with it, you don't moan about stuff. And and that culture has hugely changed in the time that, you know, I've raised my children to, to the to the much better position we are now, where you kind of say, no, 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 you've got to talk about this stuff. You've you think got about the last 10 it. years, oh, it's been Phil, huge. isn't it? The change has been unbelievable, isn't it? From a male is expected to just put up and carry on you look to, at what was now. acceptable on tv 10 yeah. years ago i mean yeah. i mean jeremy carl's the obvious example that's you know in the news at the moment that that we we enjoyed on tv we said yeah that's mm. fine you wouldn't you wouldn't dream of it now you know you're picking on people with mental health issues and you know belittling them and that kind of thing and um yeah well my kids were at, were at school which they're not now but you know that that culture completely changed in terms of well you know boys do this and girls do that it was, it was much much more mm. sensible um mm. so so i have thought about about that my initial instinct still is no i can cope with that myself but you do think well should i you know mm. <laughs> i probably don't know best on this there probably are people that do know more than me and have experience of it so i have thought of that because yeah i do i do as i said before i, I find myself looking back now and thinking i mean as you said hazel would like looking back going huh that was quite a lot wasn't it mm. yeah i kept saying to myself oh, this is fine this is fine this is fine I'm, I'm on the lucky end of the spectrum but it was still Difficult. Yeah. Someone said to me once, it's almost like running a really long marathon, like a daily marathon. And and that, what I found really interesting is you train for it, so like your your body gets ready. Then you do it, and it's really grueling, really hard. But then afterwards, you'll take a bath, you relax, you'll put, you know, you'll you get mm. a massage, you'll you'll then start to maybe you eat a bunch of carbs, your body needs it. Whereas it's interesting when you then put that on the kind of mental health side, it's like you go through what probably feels equivalent of that kind of grueling marathon. What do you do for but then we don't, uh, uh, even as a society, it's <laughs> yeah. always like that, isn't it? You the then society don't, is really weird because, yeah, as I say, everyone's been so lovely to me. That's And again, I'm so um, defensive of this industry. Yeah. I always have been. I've always thought it's a brilliant industry that does the right thing by consumers and has good people in it. And this has only, you know, consolidated that, that passion I've got for it because everybody, you know, these are people that are, barely had any interaction with at all we're, we're, we're really going out of their way to send me messages and check in and how are things going and you could have you could have scrolled past it on linkedin you could have just dropped it a like you could have done what you liked and people went way above and beyond that which was like you know uh really really um uh what's the word 
It was like a community. Isn't yeah, it? Of course. it was just really, it, it, it was really special. Mm. Um, and, I, and I don't think you get that in, in every job. Um, but yeah, it's a weird psychological thing now because you sort of want people to stop s- saying, oh, how are you feeling? How are you? You kind of go, no, that's, that's done now. Let's, let's move on. But also you do want people to give you a bit of um, uh, space and, you know, um, acknowledgement that, you know, you probably do have moments where you need a bit of a, you know, I'm still having to go and see consultants and things like that. So you still need work to be kind of supportive in that. So, yeah, yeah, do what you like. Um, so it's a, it is a weird one of wanting to put it behind you and move on whilst also important that you kind of reflect on it and absorb it and, and give yourself that, as you say, that treatment that you would give yourself after a grueling race of that, you know, recovery. Um, I don't think we're very good at that, are we? No. Just get back to normal. Yes. Yeah, get back in the gym. But that's it. Right. We've got our well-being support yeah. lasts for I think it's like six months after because exactly because yeah. of that, it takes yeah. people a while to really reflect and recognise and yeah. and and really think about what's happened. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, we it's on it's continuing even after claim payout because it recognised that it's, it's so actually important. an area that's really important. Yeah, and I would certainly when I was selling life insurance and I guess when I was talking about selling life insurance um, I don't think I'd have talked about that particularly I mean I might have mentioned it as a benefit of the policy but I don't think I could have talked about the value of that mm-hmm. and the value of that is absolutely massive again yeah. to, to all different types of people depending on their circumstance so obviously you've been through a huge amount and, and even in your career and over the last year with, with health if there was one thing that anyone you know any advisors intermediaries listen to this episode now would there be one thing that you'd want to ask them to do or any advice that you'd give them going forward i, I think the, the two things would be if, you, if you're talking to a, a you know and this is the old adage in this industry that that protection life insurance particular illness is 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 sold not bought you know no one knocks on the door and says i want to buy it um and i do think it's it's a cliche because it's true you know it's it's repeated a lot because it's true um if you're speaking to a customer about a mortgage or an investment, if, if protection isn't the primary reason for the conversation, introducing that concept early into the process in a, in a sensitive and sensible way is the, the absolute key to, to we call it making the sale, to, to, to putting that protection in place for that customer. If you, if you service the need that they've come to you for, and the mortgage advisor was where I started, that was the most obvious example. If you do the mortgage and then move on to critical illness cover, life cover, it, it feels like an add-on. Um, it's like when you take a, you know, you, you buy your TV and you take it up to the tilling curries and, and they process all of that through and they've told you that it's the right size and it's the right definition and it's got all the, you know, gadgets you need on it. They've serviced your need and you get to the till and they say, and do you want the extended warranty? You're like, no, 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 no. I've got what I came for. You've given me the advice I needed. Now I'm now you're trying to add on. Now you're trying to sell stuff to me. And no, no, no. Am I instantly I'm resisting? And that's how it feels. Mm-hmm. If you come to someone for a mortgage and then they say, right, that's all done. Your remortgage is in the bag or your, your purchase is sorted. Now let's talk about your life insurance. No, 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 no. I know what's happening here. It's so hard to do. I think you've got to make it part of the process, you know as well as making sure that we get the right rate for you and the right fixed term or whatever it might be. We're going to make sure that if you know anything happens to you um, physically, mentally, that you know, you're know you still able to pay this mortgage. You know, that's really key. It's a really big part of my job. So we're going to deal with that all at the same time. Don't worry. You know, I think that's absolutely crucial in terms of bridging the gap that we've got in this market. Mm-hmm. And then and then the second thing would be post sale. So again, as an industry nerd, Literally, the first thing I did when I came home from my diagnosis was um, dug out my critical illness policy. Um, and that's a little bit just like professional kind of pride and, and interest. And my wife was like, what are you doing? That can't be your first thought. But I was like, yeah, I'm going to dig out the policy. And amazingly, the the only document I had was the original key features and, uh, and recommendation letter um, from when I bought the policy 21 years previously. So it was the, the company I bought it from no longer existed. You know, financial mm-hmm. services are like it, it changed yeah. brands and being bought and all the rest of it. So it was like three, three, three brands ago. Mm-hmm. And and I'd had nothing since. Nothing, not a letter, nothing. So I'm a customer that's paid a direct debit every month without fail for 21 years. Um, and not even a letter. 
So that's fine for me because I'm an industry nerd. I knew exactly where it was, what it did, you know, the sums assured, the term, everything. Um, no other customer would know that. And they maybe wouldn't even know who to phone. Because if they have the, if the old brand, old numbers. You try old, ringing Scottish where, Provident. Where, yeah. like, where would they <laughs> go? You wouldn't, and then you'd maybe assume, well, I can't claim it. I don't have a, don't anywhere have to go with this. So, yeah. so that would be the biggest thing. We talked about it a lot in the market over the last few years, you know, annual statements. Uh, and I'm not just pushing the burden onto um, to uh, insurers as distributors, we you know reassured we do a really good job of speaking to our customers post sale. We've done a huge amount of work with um, you know post sale emails that explain the policy and you know that kind of communication. But we're we're constantly improving that, and I think as an industry we all need to do better to speak to our customers more regularly, to remind them what they've got, to remind them there might be a shortfall because you know 21 years. So 21 years ago, um, I had no children. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was in a completely different house with a completely different mortgage completely different job you know i'm a different person from the person that took out that policy um and yet and no one's been in touch to to ask me about it that's nuts even from a if you just park all of the consumer stuff and just from a commercial point of view you've got a customer that's paying you a direct debit every month for 21 years you're not trying to sell them anything else okay. that's crazy yeah. you know at least go off them something else and get in touch and say you want to find an uplift you look, you look like a good customer do you want something else from me you know yeah. you imagine that if you were a you know Driving around in a Volvo or something, and Volvo just like, oh, to even be. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. For 21 years. 21 years later. Especially when you hadn't cancelled it. So you're a. You're a yeah. you're happy uh, customer. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. so, in terms Crazy. of clawback, things like that, it, yeah, commercial sense to try. So, and get yeah, it. the consumer thing is where we should always look first. And, and, and you know, as a, as, a, uh, as a financial services industry, that's absolutely where our focus should be. But, you know, we are commercial entities as well, and that's stupid. You yeah. know, <laughs> get in touch with people. So, that would be the two things I'd say introduce the concept of protection early and often with with customers and and do sit in it a little bit not to disturb the need and be uncomfortable like it was 25 years ago but to make sure your customer has understood the implication of what you're talking about and has at least for a moment put themselves in the shoes of somebody that was where I was in in February and starting to think about what might happen and what the implications might be for me and my friends and my family and my job um so so that would be the, the pre-sale and the post-sale distributors and in, and and uh and insurers, we've got to speak to our customers more regularly and not be frightened that they're going to cancel the direct debit because we've suddenly reminded them that they're paying for this insurance they didn't really want in the first place. I mean, that's if, that, if that's the case, then we've done a really poor job in the first instance, haven't we? Mm. Yeah, no, well, thank you so much. Pleasure. For, for speaking Amazing. to us. That Thanks, was Phil. an episode packed full of, full of insights. And Good. yeah, thank you for sharing your personal journey too. Well, thanks for having me really on. Appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks, Phil. Enjoyed it. Thank you.